right now it's my honor to uh, uh, be here and be able to introduce my buddy Eddie Buchanan, who you will see later, but maybe not recognize. And I'm not going to give you any. what's that? Yeah, <laughs> you'll put a hat on. It'll probably be backwards. <laughs> uh, so it, you know, it, it's always great to be able to to hang out with Eddie and to uh, be able to introduce him. Uh, and you know. In the fire service world, every once in a while, we get the honor of meeting somebody uh, who has truly changed our profession. Uh, and he won't tell you that he's one of those guys, but I will. And so I've worked on, with Eddie on a whole bunch of different products, and I've worked on him uh, doing leadership training programs. But when we start talking about fire dynamics and the way we approach fire now, Eddie has done an incredibly good job of helping to take what the scientists figure out and turn that into something that we can actually use. And whether you're in a big career department or a rural fire department, a small volunteer fire department, the, the way Eddie's able to talk about it, the way Eddie's able to condense it, make it really understandable for us. And he's done that, and you don't even know when you're using the stuff that he actually produced. So, Here's Eddie. Thank you. Howdy. It's good to be back, man. I've been here a couple of times, and it's always a hoot. When somebody says, do you want to go to Montana, I say yes, and then we talk about why, because it doesn't matter. I'm coming there if I got a chance. I mean, it's really beautiful out here. Um, today we're going to talk uh, briefly about applying fire dynamics to suburban and, and rural departments, and this is kind of, I don't know, if I, I, I was here maybe four or five years ago talking about the big fire dynamic stuff, getting into the weeds of it. And this is more of a condensed version, specifically for uh, fire departments that are like me, where you, where you might have a suburban fire department. We're kind of a suburban fire department. Uh, we've a fairly large one. Uh, but we have everything from urban, suburban type of environments to work in, all the way out to remote, rural type of environments to work in. So figuring out a way to implement this stuff consistently across the board it was a challenge for us. And, uh, so my hope today is to maybe give you a handful of things that you could take back and, and maybe tweak up a little bit with your, uh, the way you operate at home and make it as useful as possible. So I'm going to make the assumption that you've at least seen a little bit about fire dynamics. If, if we need to uh, jump into some weeds, we can, but it's really intended to be a 30,000 foot view at it and some just kind of tricks that, uh, that you might want to try to implement and some stuff we're still working on too. We're, it's certainly not a a destination you ever arrived to you know you're always working there's always more research there's always something to, to do better and uh, that's kind of what we're involved with now with Hanover this was working like a second ago that's okay there it went so Hanover um, we're a northern suburb of Richmond Virginia we sit right on, right on top of that area. We operate very much in a regional way there in the Richmond region. Uh, we have the unit numbering that's consistent. Uh, we're the four, number four. That's one of the big debates you'll probably ever have in the fire service is which, which department's going to be one, you know, <laughs> who's going to be the first one. So in Richmond, it was the city. They, they got that one kind of by default. And then two and three had to fight. And we just said, hey, man, we'll just be four. We're good. Uh, so we, we have all that consistent unit numbering. We have consistent uh, communications abilities there. We can just switch channels over to the different departments and talk and, and operate pretty seamlessly. And if you look at the bottom of the list of the map down here, uh, you can see, kind of see what, what's sort of like Richmond's Beltway is kind of cutting right through the bottom of our county. And it's, uh, it's pretty dense there. But if you go all the way up to the top in the area we call Beaver Dam, that's, uh, that's way out in the country. That's, we give same day service in Beaver Dam. Uh, and then we do it in eight minutes or less down in Mechanicsville in the, in the southern area. So it's pretty diverse. Everywhere in between, you might see anything uh, happen there. This is uh, actually a GIS map that it shows us where we can get in our county within uh, eight minutes. So if it's in the green, we can get there in eight. If it's within the yellow, we can get there in, in 15. You know, it shows us based on uh, map data and like uh, Google data as far as cars moving at a time of day. It shows us where we can get to. And if you add the calls on top of that, you can see clearly there's places we just don't get to that quick, right? So you can see everything from uh, 
the engines, the full alarm pulling up bumper to bumper, where the whole assignment goes out the door and they all get there at once. And that's awesome when that happens. It's pretty rare, but it's awesome when it does. And then there's parts where the first engine may get there and wait 20 minutes or longer for the second engine to get there. And that that's, could be more of a challenge. And that's when all this fire dynamic stuff really starts to mean something. Because if you're one engine operating by yourself, what can we learn from, what has the science told us about what we can do to have a positive impact on that fire while we're waiting for the whole team to get there? That's really the trick. That's, that's, that's where it gets to be more real world uh, in trying to figure out how to do this. Okay. A little bit about our uh, department. We're, we, we're fairly busy. Uh, that Mechanicsville area is uh, too busy. We've actually got a, a SAFER grant that's recently been funded. The, the people are at work, and we're working to build the fire station now that they'll go in to try to, try to take some of the heat off of that Mechanicsville station. That's just too many calls, <laughs> you know? That's, that's rolling out of there. So uh, that would be kind of split in half with our new station 17, and uh, hopefully that will, uh, we're, we're working on funding that right now. I just got the, uh, construction price on it. We had budgeted $6.8 million to build that fire station. And you know how things are in the market right today. It came in this week at $11 million. So we'll figure out how to do that. And uh, one of the things I always try to include in all my uh, talks is a little bit of safety talk here. Just a quick safety message, you know, kind of like a, a quick couple of minutes stand down. And I want to introduce you to some people that, uh, from our organization. The sad part here is everybody photographed in this slide have all passed away for one reason or another in the last uh, little bit of last five years or so. So uh, it's been a tough go around there lately. Um, Rusty at the top left, he, he died of a heart attack. So that, that, you know, that kind of goes to talking about firefighter fitness and, and, and being ready to cardiovascularly handle the job that we have to do, uh, whether it be in, in structural firefighting, wildland, any of the applications, you know, you have to be ready to do that. Then you can go over to uh, the other side where you see Lieutenant Kegley. His nickname was Punky. Uh, Punky died of a respiratory disease that uh, was a line of duty death. Uh, that was a slow and painful death uh, for him. He really, it was several years of uh, him fighting that before he finally passed away. The guys down here at the bottom, Chief Moore, uh, I grew up with Henry. Uh, he was a peer with me, assistant chief, and he uh, passed away of of cancer a while back, and uh, it was so aggressive that he was, it was the weekend, the week between New Year's and Christmas, you know, that week in between there, he went to the uh, hospital because he had belly pain. He thought he might have to take something out, you know, maybe like an appendix or something like that, and they went in and uh, discovered he had cancer, and he was gone on February 10th. So think about how fast, <laughs> that, you know, that's like, bam, he was, he was gone very, very quickly with an aggressive form of cancer. Um, we thought, wow, that was, that was an anomaly that, that, you know, what's with that? They said it was very rare, this, this long name of cancer. Very rare, it's, they hardly ever see it. It's very aggressive when it happens. You, we would hope that would be the only time that that would occur. But over here on the right, you'll see Battalion Chief Jeff Phipps. He just passed this year of the same damn thing. That same rare cancer that uh, killed uh, Henry also got Jeff. They say it's rare. I'd say uh, maybe not, right? Something's going on. There's, there's something going on with the, uh, with, I'm not sure what it is. Is it the environment we're, wearing, we're working in? Is it the PPE we're wearing? There's lots of questions we have about cancer prevention, and I would encourage you to do everything you possibly can in your organization to try to figure that out. That station that's going to cost us $11 million uh, we designed that to be a cancer-oriented type of building. So it goes from the dirty side out in the bay, through a decon zone, through an office type of environment, into the living quarters. And there's gates every, you know, every section. So there's no reason you should come into the living quarters when you haven't been fully deconned. We basically took it to European design. So cancer prevention is a, is a problem for us um, that we've got to figure out in a big hurry. And it's kicking our ass. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what, to, I don't know, I'm sure what experience you're having here, but we're having a tough time of it trying to deal with that. And then in the middle, there's Brad, Lieutenant Clark. Brad was killed on the interstate. Uh, that third anniversary was this week. 
Uh, we just dealt with that. We're still, it's still a tough week to get through. Um, he got a, he ended up winning the uh, Courage and Valor Award for, you know, at FDIC. We got, got a lot of media attention when that happened. But the engine company was uh, just stepping off the rig at a vehicle accident during a tropical storm and a uh, tractor trailer hit him right in the tail. And the, it actually drove the engine over top of Brad. The front wheel of the engine was on his chest. They had to back the engine off of it. It's a pretty awful scenario. So Virginia now has some laws about moving over. Uh, you know, the public does better. Uh, they seem like the, the, a little better, but we're still, if you pay attention at all in the news, you'll see people getting hit all the time on the interstate. Uh, first responders, police officers, construction workers, everybody's getting tagged on a pretty regular basis. I would argue that's probably the most dangerous place we actually operate is on the interstate. Things flying by all the time. The sad thing for us is that place where Brad got hit, 38 mile marker on I-295, uh, we go there every day. Every day we go to that same spot. And it's, it's, it's unnerving. We really changed our operations quite a bit uh, as to how we block. And uh, we're, I, I will say the state police has become a great ally for that. They, they, we used to be we'd have some bickering about closing the interstate down. You know, they would be, they'd be pretty uptight about it. But uh, ever since that incident, they've been nothing but great uh, to take care of that. And we were also able to finally get state funding for the uh, highway department to come out and give us some blocking on emergency scenes as well. That, that had always been in the, in the plan, but it was never funded. Not until this happened did we get the money to actually do it. So it's been a tough year. And I'll add, it's, it's kind of scary that the three guys standing there at the bottom, they all used to work together. And the other guy there I had mentioned is Juma Henson. Uh, he committed suicide after he left the department. So, you know, we've got lots of threats to deal with uh, out there in the, in the fire service. We're going to talk about firefighting today, but this is just a small piece of the real threat picture that we need to deal with. So I encourage you to, you know, do as much as you can to try to, try to get this done. We, our, our cancer uh, position has changed greatly. We used to hear grumbling about deconning. You know, we put the brushes in the bucket and the, to do the rapid gross decon on the, on the fire ground. And we got a little bit of, oh, come on, you know, but we don't hear that anymore. Everybody's a little nervous right now because if these two guys got the same rare cancer, what fire was that on, you know? And was I there? You get a lot of that, a lot of that thought going on too. But our guys are really cool. I've, I've got a little short clip. There was a, a, a TV show called, I think it's called Body Hack or something. Yeah, Body Hack 2.0. It's an Australian show. But they came in and were doing some filming with our training guys and caught this little clip. I think it's pretty neat. I'll show you. You've got to be smart, too. I mean, we all know the stresses of this job. The heat puts on you, the gear, the equipment, it'll wear you out. I mean, you've got to be in shape. If you're not staying in shape, you're asking for trouble. I'm not an adrenaline junkie or like an extreme sport guy, but I like to put myself in uncomfortable situations. You drive to work every morning, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. It might be a very mundane day with, you know, typical run-of-the-mill calls. It could be something really serious. You know, you never really know, and that's what keeps it fresh and keeps me fresh. It keeps the job exciting for me. I could not go work in an office. Somebody could come offer me an office job tomorrow and say they pay me $120,000 a year. Now I tell them to pack sand. But if they lit it on fire, you'd be right in there. Oh, sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you want to get me to come work there, just... Light it off. Light it up. <laughs> so these are, these are great guys. They're really doing uh, all they can to, we're trying to figure this out and we got a long way to go. I, I suspect you have a long way to go. And these are the opportunities that we have to talk about this stuff and figure out what the best practices will be in the future. So I'm excited about it. The other thing uh, Tom mentioned, we'll be playing some music tonight. My, everybody's got a side job in the fire department, right? So uh, my, my side gig is I'm a drummer. I'm a, a, musician. And we're going to play tonight, so that's going to be pretty cool. So I hope you'll get on the bus and ride out to the show. Um, play for a guy named Tony Jackson, who's actually sitting in the back right now. Heckle, I'm sure he'll heckle me in a minute, probably. But uh, it's, we have a lot of fun running around the country uh, getting to play music. And it's a traditional country show, so if you like traditional country music, I think you'll be uh, excited about what we're doing tonight. And uh, a lot of fun. So we look forward to seeing you there. So talk about firefighting. If you, I don't know, what do y'all think about this term aggressive firefighting? 
Social media seems to be pretty in, intent on it, right? Like you've, everything, I get kind of chuckled sometimes when, uh, you know, they, they, they always say the first arriving engine made an aggressive interior attack and blah, 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 blah. It's always got to say aggressive. I, like, okay, I guess. I mean, I, I, the way I look at it in my head is I have, a, I have two battle plans. I have an offensive uh, battle plan and a defensive battle plan. And usually that's about it. Right, you know, the, I don't even really use the term transitional. I'm either going forward or I'm, or I'm holding steady and, or maybe even backing up. But as a general rule, that, those are the two gears. But there's a lot of debate about what aggressive firefighting is, and um, I would argue that it shouldn't be stupid firefighting. There is such a thing. There, there, are, there is some stupid firefighting that goes on uh, where tactics we have grew up with that just, you know, it's, these are things we thought we did were the things to do when we came up and the environment changed a little bit and the tactics really didn't and now it's not really the best thing to do. In fact, in some cases, things we used to do will make the fire significantly bigger. So that's one of the, uh, one of the things I want to talk today. If you really want to talk about aggressive firefighting, you kind of got to break it out into some uh, parts, right? And the first thing to talk about aggressive firefighting, you got to talk about staffing. You really got to. One of the things I think is... Uh, challenging for us as an industry is we'll go to conferences and we'll see, you know, really impressive presentations from really highly experienced chiefs that uh, operate at a very high level, you know, big metropolitan departments, and they tell us how they do it, but then we go home and we operate with a completely different picture. We don't have, like, I remember the first time I was in New York City, uh, just there visiting, and I happened to be standing, walking down the street when an alarm activation must have happened or something. Because one minute I'm walking down the street with just me and my wife, and like 10 seconds later, there's 40 firefighters standing around. Like rigs came out of nowhere. People were everywhere. I was like, where in the hell did all these people come from? I mean, they literally put 40 guys on the scene like right now. And the, my first thought was, man, I wish I could do that. You know, wouldn't that be cool if everybody showed up all at once like that? That's not the reality that we live in today. But wouldn't it be nice? So I think one of the things we have to be mindful of is when we see a presentation where they, you know, it's really cool and it's whiz bang, but can I do that with the staffing I have? And the best example I can give to that is, is really talking about like vertical ventilation, where, you know, the staffing matters if you want to do any kind of ventilation at all, really. Uh, you got to have people to do it. So I can, I can say that we will do this type of ventilation at the fire, but if nobody's there to do it, reality is it's not getting done. So, that's one of the things we'll have to look at. Another important part is timing. When do these people arrive? We dispatch 16 people on the initial uh, alarm for a, a fire. 16, 16 butts are out the door in some configuration, right? They're riding different types of rigs, and some are on pumpers, and some are on uh, aerial devices, some are on support trucks or whatever, but 16 people are coming to the fire. So that is, that is critical as to What's the sequence going to be when they get there? So uh, that has to be brought into the consideration. And then finally, you have to look at what are they going to do when you get there? What tactics are you going to use? So it's a combination of things. These three, these three things really matter a great deal when you look at it's a combination of stuff. Aggressive firefighting depends on these, these three factors. Otherwise, you're just kind of winging it. So, Figuring out your staffing, figuring out how long it's going to take them to get there, and then what in the heck are they going to do once they do arrive or assemble? And in what sequence of those tactics should they use? Now, how many people do you need at a fire? How many, what's the, what's the, tell me about out here, what are we getting? You should know it like your phone number, right? I, for me, it's 16. I know exactly. That's, that's what I need to, to fight a residential fire. I need 16 people. To, 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 to build the tactical plan that I'm used to operating from, I need 16 people to get there for me to fully implement that tactical plan. Now, they may or may not show up together. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But what do you, what's that number supposed to be? And then that way it lets you kind of work backwards, right? You can kind of, okay, let's reverse engineer this. If the perfect fire went this way, and I had all these people to work with, I'd have, them all these, I'd have all these people do these things. We'll reverse it back. Well, what if the second engine is delayed? What if the third engine is delayed? You can kind of pull it apart and, and figure out what might the tactics look like from that point. 
Now, there, are, there is some guidance that you can look for uh, in FPA 17, 10, and 20. You got to damn near be a statistician to figure out the 17, 20, to figure out what that number is actually supposed to be, because you have to be able to pull the census data out of the areas that you're looking at. So I got a whole county, I got 500 square miles to figure out what the response thing should be, and it's wildly different depending on where you look. So we have to actually dig in on the census tract to figure out what does this thing say I'm supposed to be doing, right? And it's, it's useful for grants. That's really kind of where we, not to pick on the document, but that's kind of where we use it. You know, we, we get in there for grant time, but uh, from the daily operations thing, it's more built from a tactical plan than, than any other kind of external uh, number. Is that thing clipping? Huh. And when do your, talk about timing, when do your people arrive? Who's got the longest response time in here, you think? I know, you, I know at this part of the country you can get some wing dingers, man. How, what's, what's an average response time for you? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Oh, well, I, mean, I can hang with you on that. Yeah, we can pull 50. Do I, do I hear 20? Yes, sir. Wow, okay. That's right up there with probably the longest one I've seen. Okay. Fuel up the truck before you go. Go to the bathroom before you leave. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen that uh, even in, uh, I think it was San Bernardino County, right on the, right on the outside of, of their district. They're the out most, I guess, eastern station, and the guy was telling me, yeah, we're, we're an hour, 90-minute run out there, you know, to get out to the far reaches. So they were saying, yeah, we don't leave in a hurry. We take a few minutes and make sure we're topped off for fuel and go to the restroom and then head that way, you know. So there probably won't be a whole bunch of offensive firefighting going on, you know. It's... It is what it is when you get there, but the chances of it being an interior attack are eh, probably pretty light, you know. So, yeah, the, the timing has a lot to do with it, and then figuring out how do you work it. Now, this is just an example of something that you could do. If you just wanted to make a sketch, like kind of sketch it out, you can go through and go, okay, I got, how many people do you, need, do you need for an incident command? At least one, right? Now, I know for us, you're, you're better off to have two because all the gizmos we got to deal with now. You need a gizmo operator or an accountability person and then somebody to actually watch the, the building on fire. That's, that's one of the things, I guess I'm a little old-fashioned in that way, but I really prefer somebody to watch the building burn that knows what they're looking at, you know, because it's really easy to get to moving little icons around on the board and get your Sharpie out and all that, but... Uh, somebody's got to really pay attention to that. And it, that really is more than one person. But yes, we do, in, in reality, typically kick off with one incident commander. That initial fire attack, what are you going to operate with there? What's common? Usually two. That's the goal, right? Is it always that way? I mean, that's, that's what we're aiming for, is at least two. I'd like to have more than that, but... Reality is sometimes if that first engine is operating alone, I've got three people. I've lost one to uh, incident command, theoretically. And now I've got two, but what if another task is necessary? You know, what if, what if there's a rescue that needs to be made or, or some other thing going on? So then you get down to forceful entry and ventilation, and don't forget the pump operator. Uh, that, that's also a key, a key piece of this, you know, the, the somebody to operate the pump and be proficient. That, in fact, I would say out of all the fire dynamic stuff that we've done over the last 10 years or so, our pump operations have been affected probably more than anything because speed has become a, a thing. It used to be that you had some time to get water or whatever and they, they would monkey around and you know, there'd, be some, there'd be a minute for you to get water to the attack line, but uh, anymore we're so focused on a fast attack that that pump operator, be, you gotta be moving. You better be good at your game, and if you hit a snag, it's gonna, we're gonna know it. So figuring out what, what those people, what that staffing is for you, and when is it gonna get there, and then hypothetically think through, and what will they do in that sequence? What are the things that have to happen? I'm a big fan of if we understand the, we have a common picture of what we're trying to do and how it should look, we can work backwards from that, right? So if ladders should be on at least two sides of the building, on a two-story building, that's great, 
But if I don't have the people, that's probably not going to happen, right? But if I do get, if, let's say I get one firefighter that came from home, and they, everybody's busy, they can understand that middle picture. That's something that needs to be done, I can chunk a ladder. That's certainly something that needs, that's a piece missing off this puzzle of how it's supposed to look. Understanding what that mental picture is uh, before, you know, before the fire occurs. That's a key piece of that. So that's, that's the easy parts, the staffing and the timing. Let's, let's chat about tactics a little bit. I want to just give you a few, few things you can try to consider uh, when you go, go back home and what you can implement in your department. And it's really simple, just a couple things that I want to mention. Uh, the first being the air. It's probably the, one of the easiestly overlooked aspects of this, just controlling the air. And I don't know that we all understand how important that is. Uh, and then getting water where it needs to go quickly. This is the, the basics of the basics. Basic hand line movement. Being able to get a, ha a hand line where it needs to go as fast as you possibly can. And I would argue that the nozzle is actually the easy part, right? If you're the, if you're the nozzle person on that attack line, that's, that's the easy, this is easy. It's getting that thing where it needs to be is the trick. And that's, gonna, that's where it takes people to do that, or a whole lot of experience, a lot of, a lot of tricks of the trade to get that done. Searching where we can, that's some of the latest research is really starting to point out that there's survivable spaces in places we may not have previously thought and it's important to search those spaces. And it, it, it's that, you know, are you better to remove the occupant from the threat or the threat from the occupant? That's one of the great command questions, right? If I have, if I have two or three people that are arriving by themselves at a house fire, and I've got a fire that I can see that it's right here, and I've got a victim inside that I know is right there, and I've got this little bit of resources to work with, what's my better play? Am I better to try to get that person out of that environment or make that environment not a threat anymore? That's one of the great command questions for short staffing, is figuring out what that is. So that's certainly one of the key things to talk about. And then we'll look at uh, water supply. We've really changed the way we look at water supply. And make sure, for, make sure we're on the same page. Tenders out here, right? Is that okay? Because I'm gonna start calling airplanes here in a minute. So at home, we call them tankers. So we can get very confused with the East Coast, West Coast stuff. But yeah, understanding um, what's more important to set up a, for a prolonged water supply operation or to get a quick strike, you know, to get that, make all that, all your people's effort go to that quick strike might be your better place sometimes. Really surprised how little water we're actually using when we use it right. So that's rethink, it's causing us to rethink things a little bit. I put this in here because I think it's cool. Uh, it's, it's what I didn't understand the most. When I first started to hang around with the scientist guys, and they started to really make me kind of mad about it, you know, when you first start to hear it, it takes a minute, and the, the thing that I really didn't get was pressure. I didn't understand how much of a role pressure played in a house fire. And, I mean, it's, it's really pretty simple. The, the box, you have a closed box, and you're going to pressurize the box. So if you open an inlet or outlet somewhere, if you open the box in any way, it's going to relieve pressure, right? And it's going to also want to draw pressure. It's going to create some air movement. I didn't get all that, and I didn't understand how significant it was. I'm going to show you a little video. It's from UL where we were at their testing facility in Chicago, and they had built a two-story house uh, inside this place. They got a massive facility. You can literally build and burn houses inside, right? Massive. And they built this two-story house. They were researching something completely different from what we were doing. But it happened to be the research there of the day. And we were just standing there watching them burn it. So it was cool to hear the house. I got the volume cranked up all the way, so hopefully it'll play out all right. But uh, listen to the sound of this thing when it, when it takes off.
And you hear it when it went then limited, right? I was, I was a little nervous standing there in front of that door. I was like, this, this thing might blow up and knock me on my tail, you know? It was a lot of pressure going on. We don't really get to hear that on a fire ground because of all the noise, right? There's sirens and engines and a bunch of ruckus going on at a real house fire. So this was in a controlled environment where we could hear what was actually happening. And it was pretty impressive. That's the kind of pressure we're talking about. of how that influences flow path and fire development, fire growth. This is, that's an important stuff to understand that. And then one of the challenges we still face is uh, trying to get folks to understand how to interpret flow path from inside of a fire building. And this is a little trick we picked up. We were over in Europe doing some stuff, and uh, these guys do this all the time. And I was like, what the heck are you doing? And they were, were checking flow path. I'm like, what? And sure enough, you just shine the light up through there, and you can see the air currents moving through the building just as plain as day. Right? I was like, okay, I never thought about that. But yeah, you really can. If you wanted to know, if I was disoriented in a fire and I had a flashlight, I can flip that light up and maybe get a bead. At least I'll know where the fire is and where it's trying to go and where I need to go just by looking at which way is the uh, bidirectional flow is moving. Pretty handy little deal, right? They love those little uh, flashlights like that because they'll lay down. I was like, okay, I've learned something new today. So when we talk about pressure and uh, how, that, how you can leverage fire, that related to fire development, the, the trick here is shut the front door, right? That is, even if I don't have water yet, I, can, I could have showed up in a utility truck by myself. And if the front door is open or there's openings in the building and I don't have a way to control that fire yet, button it up, close it, right? That's a simple task that every firefighter should know. When you, it's not uncommon in the old days for us particularly to have a utility truck riding around or a Yahoo like me who's in a fire SUV, right? And I, I show up and I got nothing but a traffic vest. One of the things I can do is limit air on that fire. I can choke it down just like a wood stove, close the dampers until you get some help there. That's a very useful tool that every firefighter should know. And we don't often do that. In fact, we're, we're known for not doing that. Here's a video I've been using for a while. But this is a, uh, it's a, it's a down south fire department where they had a fire in a courtyard. It was like an apartment complex that had an apartment building in a courtyard where you couldn't really drive up to it. So they're having to lay out some leader lines and stuff. They have a de delayed, delayed fire attack. So the truck goes out there and does what the truck does. They open the door. And watch what it does to the fire growth. It wasn't that bad when they first peeked in there. A little fire in the back room, right? Hey, who did you get that order to? Back it up. What, what might they have done differently? Close the front door. Control the air inlet, you know? I, just, I don't know if you can hear it or not, but one of them says in, in a minute it's going to roll right over our head. I was like, <laughs> there you go, man. Uh, nice, nice call, Sherlock. Why don't you shut the front door so it doesn't do that, right? We didn't realize back then, and, th and this is before we had much more of an awareness of it. Now we're a little bit more aware. We're starting to... Uh, see some tools come on the market. This is from my friend uh, Michael Reich down in, over in Germany. They've been using these door control devices uh, for a long time, like years. What's the date on that thing? It's got a date on it. 2008. So they, these things have been around for a while. We have two of them that uh, sometimes we'll use them, right? You know, it depends on what the, what the environment is, particularly if, uh, hotels, any place where you have uh, indoor common egress where you got people trying to move. This is a great tool to use to control the air, right? It's, it's simple. It's really simple. You can just put it up in like no time at all. Um, but it's still kind of slow to catch on nationwide anyway. And they're, they're pretty durable. Uh, you know, you always, first thing every firefighter tries to do is burn it up and see if we can destroy it. And they, they work pretty well. So controlling air. First thing, every firefighter in your fire department should understand if I'm there by myself and there's nobody to help me and I'm waiting on the first two engine to get there, at least something I can do is try to button up, right? Just try to limit air to the fire to the, the best I can. That's something everybody can do.
The next little piece is uh, using the water that we have effectively. And this is not new. This is probably the oldest stuff in the book, man. Just getting water to the fire, wherever it needs to go. This is from an old, uh, I think it's University of Iowa or something. Uh, the, the, the film was called The Nozzleman. It's an, actually a training film, like, you know, on the projector thing. But it's, uh, getting water there is an important piece of that. We're just starting to get our arms around it. When we rolled out that Slice RS thing, uh, however many years ago that was, that was, the, that was where it hit. <laughs> when we got to that part, that's where it got exciting, right? Because we, we started to talk about where we could attack the fire from, from an interior position, an exterior position, somewhere in between. Uh, that had a lot to do with it. So there was a lot of resistance to that me included. When I first heard that, I was, not, I was not a fan of that until they finally just showed me enough evidence that I was, okay, all right, so we, we can, I can get there. But even uh, with a limited amount of staffing, two to three people or even worse, you can still get some water into some spaces without having to go make an interior attack. And it's really damn effective. And they're doing, a, I like to jokingly call it, the cooling from a safe location research that's been going on lately with water mapping. You know, there's a lot of, lot of new research that you should be checking out on how streams actually go into a space, where does the water really go when it hits the ceiling, versus hitting the uh, windowsill, you know, to disperse that stream a little better. There's lots of stuff to learn about that. Hitting door frames, all kinds of little techniques that they've developed through that research, right? So there's a ton of information whether you can hit it from a window, a doorway, some in between, or maybe you have enough people to actually initiate an interior attack, whatever it is. You know, I, I firmly have the belief that the enemy doesn't care where I shoot them from, right? You know, if I shoot them from outside or inside, as long as the bullet finds its target, that's the main thing. So that's why I really don't like transitional a lot. I mean, you can call it that if you want, it's cool, but it, I'm offensive. I just happen to be pulling the trigger outside as I move inside, you know, and then we, we just go inside. It's, to me, it's an offensive attack either way. But learning, that, learning where you can get that water and how you can do it are key parts of this. This one has uh, been around a little bit, but I use it to show we're so programmed to go to the door that we will walk right past a fire, an opportunity to attack fire. You know what I mean? It's... If I was there by myself, and let's say I, God forbid, went on a fire call in a pumper by myself. I've done it. Used to do it. <laughs> what I never considered was what the hell I was going to do when I got there, right? And that, I got to learn that the hard way. I went to a fire. It wasn't until I saw the smoke up ahead as I was going in the engine by myself. I was volunteered many years ago. And I went, oh, crap. It never dawned on me that what am I going to do now that I get here? I got, to, I got to try to get, I'm going through, I got to get the pumping gear, I got to get a line pulled, all this, I'm by myself. I ended up looking like a fool because, you know, people are like, they see the fire, they hear the fire truck, they think, here they come to save the day, and then I get out. You know, it's like, where's the rest of you? <laughs> you know, and you just do the best you can, right? But the, I could have made a reasonable fire attack in this situation because I could have stopped right there was coming at that window. You know, I could have done some good there knocked it down, re reset it, as we say, and then, it, then it's an incipient fire where I can treat completely different. So there was lots of research on how to, do, you know, what's the best way to do that. This is from oh, some yeah, of the... Uh, rocket in that room. Right, roll, 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 roll. This is where we were shooting some video for some of the training stuff. And we were trying to catch exactly how we wanted it to go. That room was rocking through over here. And it really did, that room was kicking. And uh, it knocked the socks off of it. So that we had the ability to, there's nothing to do once we went in, you know what I mean? But I will say this, you should, you, getting inside to the seat of the fire is a priority. Depending on your staffing and the timing of your arrival may impact how you can do that. So if you don't have the staffing to safely do that, there's lots of stuff you can do. And that, to me, those are really interesting drills to get your uh, crews out and tinker with is to how fast can we deploy an attack line? 
that should be like a number you got in your head, like, you know, we're good, we can usually get it done in 60 seconds, 90 seconds, what? what what's this crew, what can we do to get a fire flow generated uh, under normal circumstances? And you get reps on that so that it's something you do without thinking about it a whole lot. Muscle memory. Change the stat, change the configuration around as to who's on the nozzle this time, you know, get different, different views on it. And you can really make a strong impact uh, when you don't have a whole lot of people. And you can do it wrong. 100 degrees Fahrenheit. I gotta love We're Shane's commentary. You know, no Shane Ray is. You see how it's hot enough to take the sides and things off the top? It's been said there's a debate about pushing fire, right? itself back out again, even with that open. And so we're going to take the rest of that window out. And now, as Dan says, more air, more fire. Then we ought to see it blow out now. And there's the flame. Compare how they attacked this fire with how you saw that other video a second ago. They had very specific directions about how to insert the stream into that space. This is the opposite of that. You can see what the reaction is when they when they finally make a fire attack here. Full room involvement is over 1,500 degrees for the ceiling. There's your intake. We still have Middle window is your outtake. If you hit it with a fog nozzle at the bottom, you can see, you can almost stand here and see the air intake in that room of origin. And you know that it's going on that other side. So that had a, a bit of a different reaction, right? Where it put it in, what was different was about it? Intake. That was the air intake and the fire exhaust. We got that. What was different about that fire attack? Huh? So that straight stream going through that window kind of cuts like a knife, right? It allows that window to continue to act as a vent. So you're just kind of slicing a butter knife right down the middle of it. When they came at it with a, with a narrow fog, they occluded that vent, right? They, they prevented that ventilation opening from being able to do what it does. So if you have energy going this way and then you stop it, what's the energy going to do? It's going the next best way. Right? It's going to move. So that's an important piece of this puzzle is what I would say. They would say, can you push fire? Well, I mean, you can debate the definition of it. But yeah, it'll look like you can if you do it wrong. Right? If you do that, it's going to look like you pushed it. Don't do that. There you go. Right? Train your folks that they know the difference. There might be a time when that's something you want to do, but most of the time it's not. So don't do that. Use, use a straight stream. Put it in the right place, use the proper technique. And there's lots of new stuff that recently came out of the coordinated fire attack that will help you show that. You know, that you can look at the different drills and, and how you can set up some of the different props on how to do it. This is a, one of the techniques that we are not good at at home. Uh, we're still working on it, but it's for controlling attic fires. Did she go? Should go. So the theory here is that you would pull the soffit. If you're like me, I would always fight this fire. We go in there, we pull ceiling, right? That's, or, you know, that's generally what's going to happen. We're going to go in there and pull some ceiling, maybe get up in the crawl space and attack the fire like, like we always have. Uh, the theory here is that you get better water distribution by spraying it up through the soffit along the sheeting on the inside of the roof. And it's... You know, some, some of the guys in our department were like, eh, you know, that's tricky because pulling that soffit may or may not be easy. There's bushes in the way, you know, there's lots of things. It might be two stories up. There's lots of things where it could be a challenge. Fair enough, it might not always work for you, but in some cases it might. It might be an effective tool for you, and you'll see here in a sec what one nozzle person can do with a little bit of water. They really can get a, get a long way with it. Right? So if you're by yourself, you got not a lot of help, and you got a pike pole or something, maybe you could pull that off. But he's just spraying the water along the soffit. It's going straight up the sheeting and coming right down the other side, and they're getting the best coverage of the fuel load in that attic. But we heard all, you know, our guys said the same thing. Well, they get the bushes, 
and then people put stuff in the attic and all that. But generally they don't, I mean, in some cases they might, but a lot of times they won't put like plywood all the way out to the soffit because they can't get out there. There's nothing to do out there. So usually is there, there's that space. But they pretty easily can control that fire uh, with one attack line. Works pretty well. That's something you can do to, to get a quick knock. Then there's the old water can. A little water in the right place goes a really long way. So if you showed up in your utility truck by yourself at a fire, you're waiting on the first new engine to get there, and you got a water can, maybe you could do some good, right? There's some options you have uh, to, to try to do that. And they, they get a nice, now you've got to get your butt in there forthwith and get on the seat of that fire. That fire is not out, don't mistake that. But you have bought some time. You've, and when you look at the uh, effect it has on occupants that may be trapped, it's pretty remarkable. You're doing some good work by doing that. So even a water can uh, will get you, a, get you a pretty good ways. So my, that's why I love this. Nothing better than just telling the engine to hold their line because you put it out as a truck company, right? So you have a lot of options, uh, your firefighters do, if they think about it. And sometimes it's stuff we just hadn't thought about, like getting water cans in your admin cars, right? And you got to listen to it slosh around. I understand. <laughs> it's back there sloshing. But having that water can there could maybe do you some good. If I'm riding out in the northern most you know, remote part of my county and, I'm the, and they dispatch a fire that way and I'm gonna be there 15 minutes by myself, I like uh, having a water can is good. A dry can, eh, but a water can I, can I can do something with. So pretty simple, very easy to do. Searching the uh, possible spaces, right? Uh, vent, enter, isolate, search. It's funny that uh, the debate about the isolate part. But the re I'll tell you why we put the isolate in there is because we kept screwing it up. We screwed it up most of the time. So when we were drilling on this stuff initially, uh, we would tell our firefighters, okay, you got this room, you're gonna throw a ladder, take the window, go in and search that room. And the first thing I want you to do as a priority is close the door because we've seen the data on what the open window does in a flow path, how it causes a negative impact on the occupants that you're looking for. So the first thing you want to do is shut the door. So all we had to do to completely disrupt that mindset was throw a victim in there before they got to the door. That's all it took, right? They would, they'd go in, we, we gave them clear directions, they come in, they do all the stuff, they're searching, bam, right onto a, a, an occupant, and they just start immediately doing their thing. Like, shut the door. <laughs> Don't forget to shut the door. You're making it worse for you and them. Right, so uh, that's where that isolate came from, was just to hammer it down even more. If you're old school, you might be used to that, that might be something that's ingrained in, in your brain, and you shut the door. But we found our, our new kids, we were having some hell of a time getting them to remember to do that. And that's what that was about. So working with your folks on where are the, where are the searchable spaces, uh, how could they, what could they do as a, as a you know, with short staffing, if you've got two or three people or even one, if I'm going to control that doorway, what might I do before I shut the door? Where do we know most occupants generally try to go when they are, when they are trying to get out of a fire? They're trying to go to the, the door they use the most, right? They're, they're, they're hypoxic, that carbon monoxide kicks in and they, they're able to just go to like a robot to wherever they normally go. So if I'm getting ready to close that door, it would make a lot of sense for me to See what I can see real quick. Maybe, maybe there's somebody there I could grab. And if not, nobody's there, close it to you know, slow down the fire growth. So searchable spaces, that's a big, big thing. You can go to the uh, research and a whole lot of data on that that's come out recently. And then the last thing I want to talk about of, those, of that group is uh, the water supply. So w we have a pretty aggressive rural water supply plan. Uh, we dispatch automatically the stuff we need. If, we, if the CAD knows there's no hydrants there, which is about half, depends on where you go. Like you've got municipal water some places, and other places not, nothing. You know, dry hydrant maybe, if you're lucky. Uh, and we have our 
tender shuttles, you got it. So those units are dispatched automatically. And we would put a lot of effort. We, we proud, we we're very proud of our ability to maintain a decent fire flow in a rural environment. Almost to the point of like too much, right? So we would put a lot of effort into that. We got a lot of staffing. I got like a, a company and a half. I got three or four people trying to get the water shuttle set up. I got units headed out to a fill site. I got all this going on when what I really probably could do is make this thing go away in a hot second with some well-placed water. And we started to notice this. We, we knew it back uh, seven, eight years ago probably. We were like, you know, the water usage is really not what we thought it was. We still are not quite there yet to articulate what it should be. So how, anybody remember uh, the old fire flow? What do you need for a structure of fire? Remember that uh, Iowa formula? Link times width times height divided by 100, and then you could do the percent involvement and get to the number you're supposed to have. I, I don't know if that's right, <laughs> you know? It may be, uh, it could be, but what we're starting to see now in, the, in some of the research stuff is it's not, you don't need as much as you thought. I put that picture up there because that, that was from FDIC. We were doing a uh, class with NIST and UL, and uh, we were burning a house. And this, this particular one, if I remember right, had used to about 40 gallons to control it. And that's a respectable fire, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's getting along. And about 40 gallons is what we calculated we used to control that. And that's what we were kind of, I remember standing there with Madrakowski going, hmm, well, we, we got to figure this water thing out because it's not what, we, not what it used to be. It's not what we thought it was. So here's a, this, uh, right out of the uh, coordinated attack study, you could, out of the 31 experiments they did, they were averaging around 145 gallons to do the whole business. What's in your booster tank? It varies, 500, 750,000, depends on where you are, right? We run 750s. So I, now I have to make a choice about wh where do I want to use my staffing value? Do I want to use it trying to get a, a rural water supply shuttle set up, or do I want to make sure we get that fire attack done right now? What's the better play? And sometimes it's going to be obvious. You're going to pull up, and this thing, is nothing we can do about it. It's a way. It's a defensive operation. Let's work on the rural water supply thing. But in other cases, you might get there fairly quickly, where you've got a room, in a room or two, and you can probably make that thing go away if you place the water right. Where we have burned some places up in the past is we get to tinkering with the water thing. Somebody has a problem or whatever. Next thing you know, we've never actually got water on the fire. You know, so that's what we're trying to avoid. So I don't know what the new formula is going to be. Uh, it's hard to say, but it's certainly something to look at. Our, our Jeff, uh, the battalion chief that passed away the second from can with the same cancer, he used a term called beaching the tanker, which to us is a tender, right? But he would literally say on the radio, hey, go ahead, beach the tanker, was his way of saying, don't worry, don't forget the shuttle. You this know, nose in behind the engine, and we got enough water to handle it, right? So we d it just took that whole effort of staffing and all the things that have to be done to make that happen, took it off the table. And we still, you know, we kind of like his, that's his command we still use today, just kind of to honor him. But you hear it on the radio. We, we, we on the scene with a, uh, you know, one or two rooms in a, in a residential structure, and he'll have the next new engine, you know, nose in and beach the tanker because we know it's coming. And then we just make an aggressive fire attack from there. So I'll leave you with uh, these command questions to think about. This is where the research has kind of taken us, I guess. And it's like I said before, you better to remove the occupant from the threat or the threat from the occupant. That really depends on your staffing. It depends on when they're going to arrive. The, lots of factors, right? But that's one of the toughest command decisions to make when you first look at this fire and you have to make a choice about how we're going to attack it. As goes the first line, goes the fire. So that's one of your things to wrestle with uh, as you go out of here. Um, is it a room, can I get a hose line in place quickly? Can I get a, even a water can there quickly? Can I get some kind of water in that space quickly? And that's, if, if you're bored and trying to figure out what to do on uh, drill night, 
man, you should be busy forever. You know, when would you ever have, have your attack team so, so well thought out and so well disciplined that they could handle any circumstance and, and ad lib when they have to to generate that fire stream? That's really, that's, to me, that's fun. I like that kind of stuff. You know, I don't want to sit and watch a video about something. I want to go out and do, do some stuff, right? So when you're looking for drills, this is great. Moving, getting that initial attack line with every variation of staffing that you might encounter, whatever that is. One person, two people, three people. And if you get higher than that, you're just in the gravy at that point, as far as <laughs> what I can see. Right? So, you know, and do you, are you there for a quick offense or a slower defense? Yep. That goes to the water supply issue. I added this in there. Um, this is right out of our tactical guidelines. And this is how we explain in there these two concepts. The 750 fast concept has been there all along. Ever since we first wrote this thing, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago or something, when we first did it, that was already there. We, under, we had an understanding that we have 750 in the tank, it needs to go on that fire as soon as possible, by whatever means, right? And by whatever means has changed. It used to be, it would be through the front door, you know, always, for the most part. Uh, now we know that we can come at it from a lot of different directions and get there in a hurry and get it done. The uh, slicer thing is, is really just kind of guides that first new engine as they arrive on scene. That's what we use it for. And it's uh, kind of like the rest of the acronyms. It's just a learning guide, really. So that's, that's the general gist of it. This is a... Where are we at? Oops. The technology is getting to be kind of bad. This is a situation where we actually, uh, one of the first times we actually used our research in a fire attack situation. This was a uh, wheel bound, wheelchair bound elderly woman trapped in her kitchen while the house was on fire. And we showed up in the, it's out in the middle of nowhere. And the first new engine got there uh, kind of quick. And then the battalion chief was not too far behind them. But the next new engines were 20 minutes, 30 minutes out. And when you look at the back of this thing, you can kind of see what they were working with. They went to this, the rear of the house and made an entry into the utility room door. And as you can kind of guess, the kitchen's right there. You can tell about a little window, right? You go right into the kitchen. And when, they, when the engine company, they just went for the grab. They could, they could literally look lay on their belly and look in the utility room down through the kitchen and they could see her feet sticking out from behind the bar or whatever it is at the end of the other side of the kitchen. They could see her. Like, all right, we're just going to grab her. And they went to go across the kitchen and do that. And the battalion chief, he's funny, he was, uh, he goes, I knew I was, it was like, it took all the willpower in my being to open that hand line and he did a, so he cooled the soffit right there along the top while they were making that rescue. And he goes, man, I could hear like my old, old dead chiefs screaming from the grave, don't you pull that bail back, don't you put that water on them guys while they're in there doing that. You know, he was like, it took all the effort I could possibly do to, to open that bail. But he did it, and uh, those guys got that woman out, and they took her to the hospital. She did, eventually didn't make it, but that was technically a rescue. And we were like really excited to ask them about what, what happened inside. What was that? When that water came in, what, what happened? Did you get steam burned? And they said, no. <laughs> what? You didn't get, no. We heard it coming and we kind of braced for it like, oh, shit, you know, turtle up, get ready. And they, we got wet and it got dramatically cooler. And if we could have said anything to that chief, we'd have said, keep flowing water because he actually moved off them pretty quick. He knocked that fire down and started moving down the rest of the house. And they said, we'd have rather you stayed there for a minute, <laughs> you know, while we finished up what we were doing. So that was, I mean, it's a change in, you know, kind of how we think and what we believe, but uh, we're making pretty good progress, I think, as a fire service, particularly with the help of UL and, and all those guys that are doing all that research. So this is the gist of it. Aggressive firefighting means you got to have three components to be aggressive. You got to have the staffing, you got to have the timing, and you got to have the tactics. And if you can get those three right, yeah, you probably will be aggressive. If you want a, a copy of the uh, tactical guidelines I mentioned, you may grab them right there if you wish.
one of those fancy UL code, UR, what do they call them? QR codes, right? But that's a direct download. You're going to have that PDF document and steal it. You know, just take what you want. And then I'll mention this is the closing. Uh, there's still work to be done. The NFPA 1700 document is recently out. Uh, it is a great textbook, really, on fire dynamics. It's, it's pretty much a good textbook. That's what it is. It's not a standard. It's a guide. Right? So you've got to remember that. It's a, it's, it's a tool for you to use. There's actually a research project underway now between the ISFSI, uh, UL, and it's a grant. They got a grant to produce uh, training for this. So they're going to take the lessons out of the 1700, create some online stuff that will live in the UL site, and then have a hands-on training that will be delivered by the ISFSI around the country. Uh, was it 16, Seth? 16 different regions they're going to deliver this. So you can kind of be on the lookout probably about a year from now is when that will uh, get hot and heavy. So make sure, you know, Montana is one of those regions, you know, that you grab one when they come out. But th there'll be additional resources for you there as well. I'm about out of time. Anybody got any burning questions? You can ask me at the show tonight. All right, well, thank you for your time. It's uh, awesome to be here with you. We'll play some music in a little bit, and I'll see you again tomorrow. Thank you all.